Okay, so today is August 24th, 2021, and uh, I'm here, Ger Beefstein, with Rule by Kirk, and we're doing part three of an oral history. And we sort of ended with, uh, I think the, you had immigrated, the whole family is here now, and you are starting your tenure track position at Calvin College. So can you just expa explain to me a little bit, how, how did it go at Calvin those early days? For me, it went fine. For my wife, it was, of course, not entirely new, but in many respects, a really quite different new experience. To come here now as the mother of three children and one on the way, and now having to adjust to being an immigrant. She no longer had a solid job as she did in the Netherlands before. She had no job at all except being a housewife, a mother. She could not practice her craft doing psychotherapy, uh, which had become more and more her interest. Uh, she had to learn a really new language and now really learn it, not just sort of get by, uh, as had been the case the first time that we were here. But uh, now she had to really try to master the language for everyday life uh, all the time. So for her, it was not easy. It was, it was difficult. But she never complained and she stuck it out. For me, it was much, much easier and an adventure, much more than anything else, to not only teach again, which I had come to really like, but also to think ahead of the possibility of starting some sort of psychological institute where I would pick up the kind of work that I had had in the Netherlands before. So it, it was a different proposition for, for us in a way that became, of course, a problem. But on the other hand, it forced us also to be more together. That's the paradoxical result of many a situation like that. Although in some instances, the getting more together did not happen for people. They grew more apart as the husband got a really different kind of life. So explain how that happened to you. What, were, what made it that you became more together? What were Well, we wanted both to do things together and to weather things together. And uh, so it was on, on both my wife's side and mine, uh, a real, uh, yeah, a real decision to do that. So we talked more, and uh, uh, that helped. And we also discussed, of course, the problems of another readjustment. For me, it wasn't so difficult either because I had to adjust to new situations several times already in my life as a child, and especially, of course, as an uh, adolescent uh, with the uh, war and so on. And then, uh, trying to get to Singapore as a refugee and then getting to the Netherlands and having to readjust there. So I was used to facing new situations and new problems and uh, it wasn't so difficult. But for her, having grown up in a very solid kind of middle class atmosphere in the Netherlands all her life, it was, it was more difficult. She had some pretty young children at this time, too. Well, right? Yeah, when we came here in the uh, August, yeah, it was August of 62, our oldest had just turned four. And the second one had just turned three. And then there was number three, barely a year old in November. and. The youngest one still on, on uh, about to come. Right. Sometime in the spring, which happened in, in 
April. So it, it, was, it was a different kind of set of challenges for her than for me. For me, it was more a positive kind of challenge. For her, it was a more difficult one. Mm. But we managed to get through that. And after several years, uh, she had learned the language well, and uh, the children were beginning to go to school. Uh, so the situation was different. We had a, a, a house now of our own, uh, and uh, we enjoyed, of course, that freedom. We were no longer forced to try to find a rental home. We had uh, bought a home. Well, so it was the banks <laughs> and ours. Where was it that you lived? What was your? That was right place? off the campus. Of the of the old campus Franklin, of Pelham College, Franklin Street. it was uh, it was on Thomas, okay. which uh, was just just between the campus of Pelham College and the Pelham Church, where we would go uh, on Sundays. Right. Remember, I told you that uh, my family uh, attended Dutch services there at. Uh, yeah. That campus every Sunday, right? Uh, it, yeah. it, was, it was torture for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was it in Dutch? Yeah, that's oh. why they went. Dutch and was it with the old classical Dutch singing yes. in the church? Oh, yes. With whole notes? There was a, one of the ministers, they called him Willie the Weeper, and he would, he would get so overcome with emotion, he would... Cry. Oh yeah, they were good at that during his preaching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. anyway, so um, I never attended one of those. No. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> but speaking of that, was there? Were you comfortable at Kelvin? Did everything? Oh yeah. Fit? Well, of course, there were a lot of things that were different and not so pleasant, mm -hmm. because the Netherlands had become, especially after the war, so much more liberal and tolerant in so many ways in daily life. Uh, as Calvin, my wife suddenly discovered she really shouldn't smoke at all, and certainly not be seen smoking. Mm. Uh, she should always wear proper clothes. Well, I was much more free mm. to put on jeans and lie under the motor of the uh, car mm -hmm. that we finally could afford. Uh, so there, were, there were a lot of little things that you were not supposed to do here that we had learned to grow up with and be perfectly free about in the Netherlands. Uh, so there were those things. And some of them I thought were kind of exaggerated here, but uh, it's not so important. You just do that. Right. It's, it's not a, a life-saving kind of question for you whether you will or will not have a glass of alcohol uh, outside the house. Uh, and yeah, we were not supposed to go to the theater and see a movie, for instance. Oh, well, okay, so I won't do that. We'll go to Chicago, and there we will sometimes see a movie. That was all right, you see but you should not be seen. That was for my wife more difficult to deal with than for me. Mm -hmm. And that night, toward the children, we thought, well, how is this going to be in the future? Oh, well, let's hope it will get freer then too. Now, is this the feeling on campus? Or because you sound like- Everywhere. The, everywhere, so on campus yeah. too. Oh yeah. Oh, was yeah. there a group of uh, more liberal-minded uh, professors on campus at Calvin, or did they dare Relatively not Relatively speak speaking, of course, Calvin was the hotbed of liberalism in the Christian Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. And that gives you an idea of what it must have been like elsewhere. But uh, these things were still sort of the rule at Calvin College and Seminary too, where, for instance, in, uh, a teacher uh, at the seminary years before I got there, but still, well within recent memory, had been fired because he was uh, uh, seen moving 
several times uh, out of a theater. And of course, as a seminary professor, he was not supposed to ever set foot in, an, uh, in a movie theater. And, and uh, that was just unacceptable. And then other things came out and he couldn't just stay anymore. And well, I heard that story, so I thought, well, I better not go to a movie here. And uh, I think it's nonsense. But uh, okay, I can adjust to that. I've had to deal with worse <laughs> situations. Uh, so there were a lot of little things. And at first that didn't bother us much at all. It wasn't much of a to-do for us. Eventually, with an eye on toward the children, it became a more serious question. Explain that a little bit. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that when we get to uh, why I finally left. Okay. Uh, but for instance, I could mention that now, the matter of human sexuality, mm. which in the Netherlands had become already a great deal more free. And you know that the Netherlands has become one of the most tolerant countries in the world when it comes to questions about human sexuality and drugs uh, and alcohol and so on. Uh, and that was not at all the case here. And it became one of the reasons, besides the more ideological ones, uh, later for me to say we cannot stay here and keep just adjusting to the customs here mm. because it goes against much more important things than whether you go to a movie or not and how you raise your children with respect to questions about things like alcohol and particularly human sexuality. Right. That, that became a big problem, as it still is in the Christian Reformed Church. Were you part of any discussions on campus about some of the, because, you know, we, we experience that the Netherlands changed over time. I experience that the church changed. It has changed a lot. Like you just said to me, was that the old Dutch services that they held at the campus on Sunday in, in Dutch, so there, there is change. Did you have any uh, sense that they were discussing change and open oh, to Oh, yes. It? Oh, yes. Uh, but not much on some really sensitive subjects. Because there was always the old guard outside of the immediate Calvin College community that had to be reckoned with because they owned the college. In a seminary, it was a church school, and the church was bigger than the church in Grand Rapids. And Grand Rapids could be relatively very liberal within the Christian Reformed Church, but Grand Rapids was not the church. It was just part of it, and it had to pay attention to what was going on outside of the Grand Rapids uh, house, shall we say. Uh, and that became a problem much more so later uh, when uh, I moved from just teaching to also become the major counselor of students and adults and parents. And questions came up of what do we tell our children? What do we try to teach them? What is allowable? What is not allowable? And then it was much more than just Calvin College and Seminary. Mm. It was also the much larger Christian Reformed community. And that was a position as counselor within the Calvin community, Calvin College community, that people came to you for oh, yeah. advice, students yeah, but not, well, and their parents too. Right? Yeah, but not only within that community. Later it became also more people outside of that community. Uh, and what could they expect from a counselor at the college who was also by then the chairman of the psychology department and a major teacher of students in some of the classes that dealt 
with things like human growth and development. That is how to become an adult and how to deal with the questions of real life as an adult. And uh, my ideas were much more oriented toward everything that had been going on in Europe, especially the Netherlands. Uh, so a kind of, uh, as compared with here at least, radical liberalism in many ways. Uh, and well, what did you do with that? Uh, as a major spokesman for the Christian faith, according to people outside of the immediate circle. Right, so you came into some conflict with that within yourself? I, oh yes, yes, that was, that was clear fairly soon. But I always hoped that it would not have to lead to a real open conflict. Mm. Uh, that I could avoid that. Uh, and then later I had to reflect on my unwillingness to, as it were, put my views on the table and start a controversial kind of situation, which it would have become. Did you uh, think about channeling the reformers, <laughs> the, Refor the Reformation, <laughs> because that's kind of the people of consciousness, right? Luther and Calvin himself, and that they had to come up and stand up against this institution. Well, yeah, and I and finally... There you are. <laughs> I finally had to do that. Wow. And that's why I left, because I could not expect the church. And did you draw on them at all for any inspiration? or No. Did you see the irony no. of the... Oh, I saw the irony, uh -huh. but that was too long ago. <laughs> and I disagreed more and more with several of their views too, uh, of those reformers. I began to question some of the most basic tenets of the kind of Christian faith that I had to live within mm -hmm. here in Grand Rapids. But that didn't all become clear right away. Right. Uh, that sort of gradually grew as, as my wife and I did. Uh, but since you bring that up, I might as well mention it. Well, you can say there are three major uh, pillars on which the faith here was resting, and you could not compromise with those. Uh, you could maybe compromise with a lot of things out in the world, like movies or dancing or alcohol, as, la as later oh. happened. But uh, you could not compromise and you could not question some of those absolutely basic tenets. And that's three of them. One, the nature of Jesus. Uh, what is the nature of Jesus? Uh, particularly, of course, the divine nature of Jesus. That could not be questioned. Mm. Ever since Nicaea in the early fourth century, that had become absolutely a given. Mm -hmm. Completely human and completely divine. Uh, or you could quibble about some things a little bit, maybe about when exactly did he become divine? Was that from the very beginning, before time, or did that come later? He's called the Son of God. Well, what does that mean? Doesn't that suggest it came later? But those are intellectual, theoretical kind of things that don't bother anybody. Uh, but as he was divine, no question. He's not just some kind of great, good teacher, like Lao Tzu or, or the, 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 the Buddha, maybe. Uh, no. He was God. That's one. Second one, the authority of the Bible. Oh, you could quibble about some details, whether you should take those literal or not literal. You ever hear in your background the discussions about what did the serpent in the garden speak? Did you hear that? The that there have been splits in the church about that. The language? Yeah, well, yeah, and, and did he really speak? Was it really a serpent? Uh, was it really an apple? Uh, things like that. 
I remember well the one full page in the Grand Rapids Press from time to time being bought by one of those who insist on the total inerrancy and literacy, literalness of what the Bible says about this, that, and the other. The Bible says seven days, it was seven days. No nonsense about, well, it's more metaphorical, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says days, so it was days. That was a fellow by the name of Peters, <laughs> remember that? Yeah. Who uh, had become rich because he had invented something very practical, like how you made uh, butter look like butter again by mixing the white stuff in the, in the little plastic <laughs> uh -huh. container with some butter ball things that had the proper yellow color. Yeah, and what was his name? Peters. Leo Peters. Peters. Yeah. Uh, he, he had a beautiful great house on Franklin and uh, uh, Plymouth. Okay. Yeah. Be beautiful house. Yeah. No, I remember those controversies. Yeah. But you could not really question at all. And he took an ad out in the graphics press? Full actually... page ad from time to time. Okay. And he became so angry at Calvin because of some professors professing, <laughs> that's what the word professor, I guess, ordinarily means professing a different kind of view about the literalness of the Bible and emphasizing more that there might also be some metaphoric or symbolic things mm -hmm. uh, which would make it more understandable and acceptable to the modern mind and science and so on. No, he wasn't going to have any of that. So the, the, the inerrancy of the Bible of the scriptures, and you could not question that. Well, I was beginning to more and more because of my readings and, and listening to preaching and so on from then on. Right. Began to question more and more. And finally, uh, there was the uh, uh, question of, of the church as really the proper way of telling you finally what to believe. Uh, no more all that, all that freedom uh, that they were proposing in other churches. Uh, they were falling down the path of forgetting the authority of the church. Uh, there was more, but those were three pillars that, that I had to accept and no compromise, no discussion, no questioning of that. I was told to my face by a colleague at Calvin too, mm. that, uh, ah, Piker, you think too much, you ask too many questions. You should learn here to just believe mm. like a child. And I thought, man, mm. Yeah, it may say in the Bible, unless you become like children, but it doesn't say unless you remain like children. It says you may have to develop a whole lot first before you can come back. But no, he wasn't going to have no. uh, any of that. No, you should just like a child believe what you're told. Was there a 10-year process at Calvin that you had to oh, go yeah. to and did you? Oh yeah, but I went through that too fast to get into trouble. Uh, within two years, I was an associate. The two, within two years after that, I was a full professor. Wow. And they wanted me to become the chairman, which I then became when I was full professor. So in about three and a half years, I was a full professor and I became chairman. And so that was behind me. I didn't have to worry about that. Okay. I had tenure. Well, then talk a little bit about when it when it got to uh, obvious that you needed to move on, was there pressure from the school no. to do that? Or no, just... on the contrary. Okay. Well, uh, I started talking about both the more intellectual principles, like the authority of the Bible and so on, uh, with some 
which I thought and believed then were the more liberal-minded colleagues, I did start some conversations and that taught me fairly quickly I would have to be very careful, very cautious. Uh, but they accepted me otherwise fully and completely. I was very much part of the college community. And especially when the Institute came after a few years, uh, in 1965, I think, uh, that began very small. Uh, I began to do more of the counseling for which they had sometimes hired some outside psychologist. Uh, but I began to do more of that and I began to do more testing and I got more students to work with me, learning to do some testing and so on, which was the idea of the Institute in the first place. And uh, I began to do more psychotherapy with students, more at, at a deeper level too. And that's where some problems came up. I remember particularly the problem of homosexuality mm. and pre-marriage sexuality, premarital sex, uh, and homosexuality that was still so completely taboo that could not be discussed. I mean, that was simply a sin and a disease. That's it. Right. And my colleagues in psychology at that time thought so too. And that that crazy American Psychiatric Association was beginning to talk about scrapping homosexuality from the famous diagnostic manual. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was just that was just wrong. They didn't want to have anything to do with that. No, it was a sin and it was a disease. And uh, you, certainly, if you practiced it in any way, then uh, uh, you were out. I've had counselees telling me that that happened to friends of theirs within the church, that they were just kicked out of the house and said, I don't recognize you as my son anymore, or my daughter even, right. a couple of cases. Uh, so to me, that became one of the great sins, if you will, of the church and community. You couldn't even talk about it. Wow. Later that came, as you may have noticed, at the synod, which met year after year after year, eventually that began to be talked about. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that started, maybe in the 80s or 90s. Uh, and, and that almost led to some real splits in churches of the Christian Reformed Church. Uh, and uh, they found a solution. Well, since you bring this up, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, a kind of weird solution, I thought. Well, I was long gone from the church and the community by then, but I, I did sort of pay attention to what was happening. I've always had a soft heart for Calvary College. It, it right. was a, good place to be and they were good to you. for me, and they were good to me. Mm -hmm. I have always looked at them as, as friends that, that had to finally agree to really disagree, mm -hmm. uh, not as enemies. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of them did look at me as an enemy, a renegade, but I have never experienced that. No, mm -hmm. no, absolutely not. Uh, so I kept up a little bit with the news from the church and the community. And then I discovered that a, a sort of compromise had finally been accepted in the church that, well, homosexuality, if you have that inclination, well, that's too bad, of course. Uh, it, it's, it's wrong, but okay, uh, as long as you keep it to yourself, uh, as long as you don't practice it in any way, uh, you can still be accepted in the church, but don't do it. It's that, like Bill Clinton, right? Don't ask, don't tell. Well, <laughs> I, I would compare it with that a little bit. Yeah. Don't ask, don't tell, and don't do it. And don't do it. That was the critical thing. Right. 
Right. You should not give in to it. You should seek therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in those days, there came some attempts to develop a kind of therapy against homosexuality. Right. Did you have any requests for that in any of your... I didn't buy that. Okay. No. I thought, well, then frankly, seeing how sexual behavior I hear about within families regular, so-called regular heterosexual behavior, I think there is at least as much a need for a therapy for heterosexuality (laughs) than for homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you look at the graffiti in the journals of the the student uh, at the college, Mm -hmm. uh, you will think... What's wrong with these people? Wow. They are as sordid, as dirty, as as strange-minded mm-hmm. as anywhere. Mm-hmm. And the incidents of not only homosexuality but things like child abuse and uh, spouse abuse mm-hmm. in the Christian Reformed communities is as much or as large as anywhere else. Maybe worse sometimes. Right. Uh, so uh, no, I I would never ask either. But I would never have considered that. Mm. Uh, it's not just a choice either. Uh, choices you can always talk about and try to change. But I, I guess it's like many other things. There's a kind of normal curve, you know. Most people are not too far from the middle. And there is some flexibility there. But there are some that are very far one way, and there are some that are very far the other way. And, well, yeah, what do you do then? You have to, to recognize that that is how nature behaves. And that's another thing. Nature did not have such a good press in the Christian Reformed Church. I've had students come to me and protest after class that you talk too much about nature as good. Nature is evil. That's sinful. That's what the fall is all about. That's things I learned to <laughs> recognize yeah. in those first several years at Calvin College. Now as a real member, as a tenured professor. Well, uh, the institute uh, uh, became a center of counseling also for students who couldn't go anywhere else, particularly when it came to homosexuality. Mm. They couldn't talk with their parents, they couldn't talk with their teachers, they couldn't talk with their minister, but they were serious about their faith. And they were taught, basically, that they were sinful and diseased critters. Mm -hmm. And, well, yeah, there was that institute now. And at least I had the reputation of being one you could talk to, and you could be sure that whatever you said wouldn't go anywhere else. Uh, They had learned that. Mm -hmm. That that was sort of a holy thing for me to... And uh, so I got more and more to hear about things like abuse and things like not being able to tell their parents anything that really counted in their lives of every day. And uh, that concerned me more and more. Yeah, it sounds like it. And And, yeah, yeah, well, if I make it, finish this, I tried to talk with some colleagues. That's what I was going to ask. And uh, it came to some dramatic moments from time to time and uh, that's when I found out you can go so far but there are these absolute borders you don't cross that border because that's too far right I remember one uh, and if I may may tell an anecdote in particular uh, I was invited to a special kind of meeting uh, when I had just told the college I wanted to leave. 
to a meeting at my church, the Reverend Boomsma, who was a leader in the, in the church. He was well-respected and well-known uh, chairman at Synod and, and things like that. And uh, a professor in ethics at the college and the seminary, Henry Staub, I could mention the name, mm -hmm. there was no secret about it. And the very well-known professor of philosophy, Al Plantinga, mm -hmm. you may have heard that name. Mm -hmm. He later went to Notre Dame, mm -hmm. and he even a couple of years ago got that, uh, what they call the genius prize, a million dollars for the work he had done through his life, and especially his tenure at uh, Notre Dame in philosophy about religion. Uh, so that, that was a high-powered meeting that my wife and I were invited to at the church. And uh, we quickly discovered that the objective, the purpose of that meeting was to try to convince us, especially me, to stay, mm -hmm. to not break away from the church and the college. They wanted me to stay. The president of the college, Spulhoff, was all for that. He had even gotten me an offer from the board to go on sabbatical. No strings attached, but just to to talk with each other, to try to come to some kind of modus vivendi, mm. some way of being able to go on together uh, and, and not totally break away, but a little give and take on both sides. This was a very generous yeah, sounds beautiful, and, and right? real, real wonderful offer. Reaching out, but, yeah. Uh, it didn't take my wife and myself long to decide, no. Mm. We have found out now that, that you just cannot cross certain border points uh, and still feel you, you, you can be at home. Uh, if, if you don't do that, if you don't cross them, and still feel at home. What were the alternatives for you, though? Where would where were there you? There was going? none at the time, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a big decision. Yes. But we always had in mind, well, we can always go back to the Netherlands. Uh -huh. We both are diplomats. Uh, we both have all the proper credentials and experience by now, and we'll we'll find a job. Mm -hmm. So we seriously considered that, but the Netherlands had changed too. This was the end of the 60s now, and the beginning 70s. And not everything that had changed there, we liked so much. It had become very much more leftist. Mm -hmm. uh, the government, not only, but the general culture. And I could live very well in a democratic country with a more leftist government, but to have to participate in that, that's another matter again. We really want that. I wasn't very conservative, obviously, in some ways, but in other ways uh, I was. Uh, uh, not so progressive, perhaps. So that was a question. My wife, the same. Uh, so yeah, where did we go? We, we didn't know, because mm. it was the end of the spring semester that I finally uh, cut the Gordian knot, knot and uh, resigned. We had the whole summer. My salary was always over 12 months, so I had at least through August uh, to contemplate things. And my wife had started to work here a little bit uh, in psychotherapy. But the other would not have been enough to continue. And it was just uh, that time that I got an offer from Grand Valley. Oh. Well, it wasn't immediately a straight offer, but I had given some lectures at Grand Valley. And uh, those had gone well. One was about dreams, and especially the students like what I had to offer on sleep and dreaming, particularly also the interpretation of dreams. 
that's where my Jungian background, of course, helped. And they were interested in that. And uh, maybe that helped to convince some of the faculty and administration that they would make a sort of informal offer to me after I had given those lectures. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, I had gotten a, a little note, a letter, to thank me for the lectures. And by the way, if you ever feel like you might want to look for a job here, uh, let us know. Mm. Which was sort of an underhanded way of saying, we are interested in you. So that is we were in the summer. Do you that. remember who that note, who was that note? Well, that was from the dean of the college which, had to, which was then had just formed Thomas Jefferson College. Okay. That's where I had given those lectures. Oh, wow. Uh, Grand Valley had at that time just uh, become divided into four. two colleges and fairly soon three. Okay. Uh, and you went to one of those. There was four. Uh, well, and then eventually four. But the third college was William James College. Right. And that's where you went, right? And then there was, that's where I went to, I started at Thomas Jefferson. Oh, you did start at Thomas Jefferson? And then I went to uh, James. Oh, yeah, okay. But one of my good friends, David Bernstein. Was, he was at College 4. He was at College 4. Yeah. But then he, and then he eventually was at the psychology department. Right, when the three other colleges, besides the main college, uh, had to close. That was in the 80s. There yes. was the great crisis that came about then. Right. And all of a sudden, the Dow Jones went down uh, 500 points from 2,500 or something. So mm -hmm. that was a big crisis. And yeah. in those days, they started to close down those other colleges, like William James and My wife College and I did a film on it called The Unfinished Conversation. Oh, OK. And we interviewed yeah. lovers and many of the faculty. Oh, yeah? About that. I never saw that. I'd like to get you a copy. Yeah, that would be nice. I'd yeah. be interested. Uh, I later became great friends, well, I can't say friends, but uh, quite close to lovers. Uh, he and I had a lot of contacts. I really the, liked him too. He was a he, good man. Well, the college grew from when I came, there uh, about 2,000 students, a little uh -huh. less, to now more than 25,000. So right. he, he made it, at least had a big right. hand in making it grow. Right, so you so, got this note and there was an offer and then what happened? Well, there was no offer. It oh, was sort of a suggestion. An understanding, right. let's say. So I thought, well, let's get, let's call Glenn Valley. So I did and there was immediately interest and I was asked to come and visit. And I talked with the uh, uh, vice president then. Uh, the, the, the dean Nie, also. Niemeyer? Is that the, no, no, Niemeyer came a good deal later. Oh, did he? No, this what was about Jellema? Did you know John Jellema? His father was a. His was father a, was famous. Was Jellema. Yes. Uh, and uh, he was a big professor at Calvin College and before that in Indiana. Right. And he was really the idea behind Grand Valley at first. Wow. His kind of true liberal arts college. Right. That's how it started, and it didn't go anywhere for a while. Uh, but he was the professor of philosophy mm -hmm. at the General College of Arts and Sciences at Green Valley. And I, I knew him from Calvin College as one of the more liberal <laughs> professors. And later I met him, of course, again at Green Valley. Uh, he was he was a big man. Was there John anyway, Jellema Sr. and John Jellema Jr.? John Jellema was his son. Right. One of his sons. Yes. There was a Dirk Jellema who okay. was in history, and he was at Calvin College, a full-time professor. And was that John's father, or that is his brother? Because no, John's father was very well known. That Calvin. was the Jellema that at Calvin College okay. had started to bring up the idea okay. of a new kind of Liberal Arts College, which eventually became okay. Grand Valley. Because John, the, the the younger, was a colleague of my wife. Yeah, he was at. Uh, and he was at uh, William James. He was at William James, and, and he was in English. I, he was in English. I liked him a lot. Yeah, too. and he was a brother to Dirk Chelema. Okay. Uh, so I knew all of them. Right. The father, as well as the uh, two sons. So you went and visited. 
I went and visited the vice president, and he immediately uh, made me an offer. Couldn't be a regular full-time offer, okay. but uh, a half-time offer, because uh, all the full-time slots had been given and taken in the spring. And uh, he made sure I got an extra bonus <laughs> salary, <laughs> so that it was a, a, a full half-time job that I got, that is at a regular pay of a tenured full professor. Okay, not as which, adjunct. <laughs> not as an, well, officially adjunct, but a uh, special uh, compensation. Uh, compensation was made for me in the uh, business office. Ah. I don't know what they thought of it there, but uh, <laughs> that happened. And uh, so we said, well, Next year, I may be a regular full-time professor. Uh, Ine is beginning to get some clients that pay. Uh, the children are getting into elementary school, all of them now. The youngest one was six, seven to be in the next year. So, well, let's stay here and see what happens. So I stayed uh, at Grand Valley and, well, that's a weird story, too. That was in quarters at the time. Right. So the first quarter, during the first quarter, the counseling center at Grand Valley discovered that I was on campus. Mm. And I was now a member of the psychology department. So they reached out to me. They had a couple of young counselors, but here was this experienced guy from Calvin College who was a PhD too, and they thought, let's try to get him too. So they offered me another half-time, full salary job to work half-time in the counseling center. Ah. And I said, well, I said it. I'm not sure I meant it. Well, this is the way the Lord works. So there we go. I became a half-time counselor and actually the chief counselor at that center, at that uh, counseling center. And uh, okay, so I was a full-time employee at Grand Valley come January of 63. And... Uh, no, uh, 60, 60, 73? Uh, 70, 70, 1970. I left Calvin okay. at 69 okay. in the fall, and in January 70, I was a full-time employee again at Grand okay. Valley. And as if that was not enough, during the second quarter, there came a revolution in the psychology department, which had hired several new young Turks fresh PhDs from uh, the universities, and they didn't like what the old uh, professor chairman had done in the few years that Grand Valley had been around. Mm -hmm. uh, they were of the modern school, and he was actually an educator. He had a PhD in education, not in psychology. And in those days, it began that psychologists became very, very jealous of having a PhD in psychology. Mm. And you were to teach at the university, you should have a psychology degree, not just an education degree. Mm. And here was the chairman and he was an education man. And that showed in the way he ran the department. And here were these young Turks who uh, fell on top of the world and let the world know. And during that second quarter, they went and started battle with their chairman. Mm. And again, the moment he had had enough of that. He was in his late 50s, so he resigned as chairman. Mm. He stayed on as teacher, so they were suddenly without a chairman. And that's where the administration thought, yeah, but we're not going to appoint one of those new full-time young Turks as chairman. So they looked outside and uh, they thought they had found one that was 
one that had been at the old college of the new president, who had become president in that fall, previous fall, Lubbers. And uh, Lubbers thought he had found the right person to head that psychology department now. So he was coming. But then they thought, well, we have an even better place for him. And he became the new dean <laughs> of Thomas Jefferson College. Gilmore? It was then Gilmore. Yeah. So they again were suddenly without a chairman in the psych department. And it was getting to be March already. And they thought, what am I going to do for the third quarter? Well, there's this, this Dutch guy <laughs> from Calvin College, and he's been chairman there, and he's got a PhD and everything. So they asked me, well, will you be pro tem chairman? So I thought, well, why not? Mm -hmm. I got accepted by the Young Turks, by the way, okay. <laughs> who had gotten to know me a little bit more in that, in that uh, first and second quarter. Uh, so I accepted. And so when the third quarter started at Good Valley, I was the new chairman there too. So within a year after leaving Kelvin College with no job, I suddenly had an extra <laughs> full job at Grand Valley. Yeah. Uh, half, half time in the SEC, half time in the counseling department and the chairmanship. Uh, it couldn't have been better, could it? And my wife was beginning to get clients and she enjoyed that very much, and she was good at it. Uh, and uh, well, so they asked me to stay on, no longer pro tem, but regular chairman in the next year, 70, 71, that, that year. And uh, we had it made. Wow. Do you ever get the feeling that there's some kind of light shining on you because <laughs> I'm just listening yes. to your story. There's always all been my life I've been very, blessed. very fortunate. <laughs> yes, I wouldn't say blessed okay. anymore. I know because I learned not to think that way anymore right. yeah. in the Netherlands. Thank you for after correcting we came me. there. Yeah. Well, the story is simple. I I always wondered about that blessing business, right? Right. But I always wondered about. Why, why not this me? Guy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I heard people say, why did this happen to me? Right. And then I couldn't help thinking sometimes as a 17, 18 year old, well, why wouldn't it happen to you? Mm -hmm. Why only to those other people? So I, I, I didn't already like anymore in this whole business of you were particularly blessed right. because you did well. Uh, and then I came to the Netherlands and with a family member uh, on my father's side of the family, I got to hear, yeah, but we in our family, uh, we were blessed during the war and the occupation. Uh, we, we had it all right. We didn't have to suffer. And that is because we were such good church Christians. And I thought, that is blasphemy. I couldn't help thinking that, even though I was only 19 years old. And, and that really set me up against all this talk about you are particularly blessed. Definitely. And I had to hear that kind of thing a lot. There were a lot of people right. who, who really thought they were deserving mm. of the blessing. Mm -hmm. And I had learned that that was not very Christian, really. So uh, I, I thought that, I really thought that was blessed. Well, good. Thank you for correcting me, but I did have a feeling of hearing your story and the and the fortune, how fortunate. Oh, I can understand that. That's and that's so beautiful. I'm really uh, grateful. I can understand that people talk about blessing. Right. But I, for myself, don't want to hear that word because I, it, it has some sort of specially deserving right. of the good. And uh, no, let's be just very thankful right. and recognize that you have been much more fortunate than a lot of other people. Right. I think that's good enough. Yes, that's good enough. 
but how wonderful to uh, to end up just you know just two halftime position and then chairman of the department. It's like boom boom. Yeah, it, 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 it was unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, well, let's face it. My wife was by far my first real blessing, <laughs> if you will, yeah. uh, and stayed that way. Right. When um, so she started her practice. When besides the counseling center at Calvin, did you have a private practice at all while you were? Well, did you see people on a regular basis. I began to get some private patients from outside the community of Calvin. And, uh, well, I let them visit me in my office at Covenant. That was all right. And you were uh, allowed to have some private extra ways of making some extra money okay. uh, as a professor. Uh, it shouldn't take too much, of course, of your time and effort. But that was not seen as bad. And, well, in so many universities and Departments like psychology or medicine, they don't just teach, they also still practice right. their trade. Uh, and so I did that more and more also. I got some very interesting adult patients who had mm -hmm. heard about me and were not Christian Reformed or anything, but had heard that, that I was at least somebody that you could talk to, uh -huh. even though he was a Christian. <laughs> That was another experience to get people <laughs> who who were sort of relieved to find out that I wasn't the kind of Christian they had come to expect right. because of their experience <laughs> around Calvin College. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a zany world yeah. sometimes, you I know, this a, whole I, business. I'm interested in hearing about your first sabbatical. And you were probably still at Calvin then when you went back No, to I didn't go on any sabbatical. Did, when I was, did you go back to Nederland for I a was year? Too, too, I was too busy. But didn't uh, you and your whole family spend a year? Oh, yeah, back? but that came much later. That was in 90, 1975, Okay, well, six. We're, we're already in 71. Yeah, so, so I stayed on as chairman. And then you got a sabbatical from Grand Valley. Then. Well, then after six years there... And they reckoned my first year, 69, uh, 70, as a full year. So after six years, uh, I was due for a request for a sabbatical. You had to have a project, uh, which, of course, I had. I'm going to translate it. My, I was going to translate my history book of methodology in the psychology discipline. Uh, and that was good enough as a project. So that's when from I Dutch got a sabbatical from Dutch to English, was the plan. And uh, uh, my whole family went with me, of course. Mm -hmm. We got a house to rent in uh, the Netherlands. Where? In Kokkingen, which is close to a little town on the river Breukelen. And uh, we, we found the house of people who were going to Africa for a year on some kind of missionary work. Okay. Uh, and they wanted to rent the house out. And so there, with now four children. What provinces? Uh, is it Holland or what is no, it? No, that, that, that is, it. uh, it's not far from Utrecht. Okay. It's a little north on the road yeah. to Amsterdam. Okay. Uh, you come by, if you go by train or rail or a car, you you pass one of the exits that lead to Breukelen. Mm -hmm. And Breukelen is on the River Vecht, which runs from Amsterdam to Utrecht. Yeah. And that's where uh, the town it is now, Breukelen is. Yeah which is an old Dutch town with a castle and all those things. Wow. And uh, close to that, more in the, in the polar, in, in the meadows of the cows and so on, is a new, fairly new town, Kokkegen, mm. uh, or Kokkengen, mm. as <laughs> a friend here always managed to 
practice in <laughs> yeah he didn't know how to say Kokkegen. He, he tried to learn it but he, he always always sort of right. struggled to say like Scheveningen. Yeah. yeah oh yeah Scheveningen was <laughs> the, the sound yeah. in Dutch is, is but it impossible it was often used as a password against the Germans right for yeah because they would make it Scheveningen they couldn't say they, it they, they couldn't say it properly no um, yeah. So what what was that year like then that you were there? Oh, that you, was that was nice. Did you feel did it feel good? Did people did you visit with family? Did you? Have, oh yeah, we stayed at first with my brother's family, right? Who was a lawyer and who had a big house in Utrecht, yeah, and uh, with a lot of room, and so we stayed there for a while, uh, and until that house was found in Cocaine and then we had our own house. Yeah. But, oh yeah, I often took a bike ride from Cocaine to Utrecht to visit my brother and his wife. Yeah. And uh, uh, the others took a, a, a train, which in the Netherlands, of course, was right. ideal transportation. Yeah. And Eni and the kids enjoyed themselves? Oh yeah. It was a whole year? That the you... kids went to a Dutch school uh -huh. and they learned Dutch. Yep. Uh, for a year and enjoyed it and uh, uh, they, the oldest one especially learned to talk Dutch again very fluently and without an accent mm -hmm. because her first years were in the Netherlands right. as a baby and uh, in Grand Rapids at yeah. home we always spoke Dutch with her so Dutch was her first language. What we call the mother tongue. The mother tongue. Are right. you familiar with the work of Jacques Lacan, the Freudian? Jacques Lacan, Lacan yes. And his... But that's a Freudian who made it big in France in the 80s yeah. and 90s. Yeah. That came later. But somehow his work with language is very important. Right? Well, yeah, he was a language uh, specialist in many and ways. He has the idea that the mother exchanges words are, uh, yeah, words, mother gives food and then she exchanges food for words and that's why it's called the mother tongue. Could well be, I, I don't know. I, I love the I idea know. of that and he because has... that's my experience too. Oh, oh yeah. I was, um, Dutch was my mother tongue and I was five years old, five and a half, and then my father died after four years, so we went back. And we spent a year, and I was in third grade and fourth grade in Dutch school. But I was also a celebrity in my village because I could speak English. Yeah, <laughs> They were like, yeah. it was like, this kid is the smartest kid in the world. He could speak two languages, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, And they so, forgot that that is done in many places in this world. Yeah. And now I think many people in the Netherlands can speak more than one language, like English is pretty common. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I grew up with three of them. <laughs> but because, when I heard about that from your family, I thought, well, that's, I really enjoyed that year that I spent. I was from nine years old till 10. Oh, yeah. A whole year. And uh, I loved that year. Yeah. And, uh, and that hearing, you know, my story, of course, is the tragedy of losing my father and my mother. Seeking, you know, her not being lost, you know, she's, my father was 51 years old, my mother was probably 50, and, uh, you know, having to lose her husband at that young age and having young children, and, uh, but then after a year, because I had two older sisters that didn't want to come back, mm. and they stayed in America, lived with an uncle, mm. and then she felt like she had split up the family, so we moved back again. Uh, yeah. Well, when I, mean, I hear you say Dutch words, I recognize that you must have learned it as a child. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's quite quite noticeable. And what I learned, of course, is uh, Chronings, you know, the dialect. And, uh, Even so, in school, you learned school, official Dutch. In school, we had uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Shall we take a little break here? Fine. Okay. Good. Can you imagine that if we had stayed Calvin, there might have been some trouble with Tini. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you would have had special counseling. Because of Jeannie? Yeah, because of Jeannie. Um, yeah. So we were, we were talking about your sabbatical year in Nederland, and it sounds like a really wonderful time. So then you come back, and then you're at, we end up at Grand Valley, where we kind of left off, and uh, well, we just talk a little bit about um, how the, you know, I think there's a family vacation. Was that the, was that vacation before you went to Nadalon on your sabbatical, that you had that car, and you went camping, and you were in Canada? Tell, tell that oh, story. Oh, that was. At the end of our first two years in the United States at, at Calvin. Okay. That was at the end of the second school year. Uh, you, you, you want to talk about that? Yeah. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. Maybe it's a good example to show how young Dutch immigrant males can be a real weird person <laughs> in the way they think they can do things. Well, uh, it, it is quite a story. Uh, see, I was down at Calvin after those first two years and about to go back to the Netherlands, but it was only May, the end of May, and we weren't do in the Netherlands until September, when my new temporary job there would start. So we had a whole summer. And uh, that's when I got the crazy plan to see something more of the United States. Because mm. we, we hadn't really gotten out of Michigan to speak of. And I thought, well, we have this nice new Dodge station wagon. I got it used, and I had gotten to learn to drive a car. I hadn't had a driver's license before, but I got that here very quickly. And uh, I, I liked driving, and uh, well, why don't we use those couple of months to make a nice real road trip, trip uh, and go camping? We had also learned to go camping as something typically American, and we had uh, learned to really like it. And uh, so why don't we go south for a while, uh, like Tennessee, Kentucky, and then go east to the east coast, and then go up north and see some places like Washington and New York and so on, and Boston. And and then and then yeah we do have to leave the United States uh, to pick up that, that to get on board ship in Quebec, for which I already had an, uh, uh, a ticket with the whole family, which then would include also my mother, who had come at the end of our first year here to help with the kids, and there were. Two by then, one of two years old and the other one almost one year old. So they needed a little extra help. Yeah. Okay? So the well, family thought that was great. Then I found out, well, the trouble is you cannot sell that car in Canada. It's an American car and you cannot sell American bought cars in Canada. I said, oh, well, then uh, we'll make sure that we get into Quebec uh, a few days early, like three, four days, and then I have at least two, three days to go back to the, across the border, which is not very far, back to the United States and sell the car. It's a, it's a good car, and I'll sell it cheap, and, and I'm sure that within a couple of days I'll find one, and, and uh, let's find out how do I get back to Quebec, and then I found, oh, there's a bus that runs once a day uh, from Maine to Quebec. Okay. Family thought, well, he's a little crazy anyway, so let's do this. So 
we, I planned the trip, uh, which would take something like five weeks, and uh, uh, we left Glen Rapids and said goodbye to our friend and uh, uh, went south. And at first it wasn't too eventful. We, we camped along the way and we got to see the Mammoth Cave uh, way south there. And Did there was you have a, a tent then? You put oh up yeah, a we put up a tent. Okay. and uh, uh, Two tents as a matter of fact, one also for my mother and uh, the kids and one for uh, Indy and me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had, of course, some guide where we could find campings and the like. And we camped at Mammoth Cave and, and it, it was really nice. And Mammoth Cave was interesting and we saw something along the way. And that's where I had my first experience of real separation of the races in this country. But in places like Tennessee, Kentucky, there were still at gas stations the two different tours if you had to go to the bathroom. And blacks only or whites only. So I went into the white only and they looked at me a little funny, but well, with my accent, they didn't want to make too much trouble. Mm. Uh, so uh, they didn't even ask me where I came from and whether I was really pure white. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was my first encounter with this whole business of segregation of the of the races. Your whole life, your first encounter in your whole yeah, life. Yeah, I had never encountered that. In Indonesia, we, we had, of course, some kind of color line habits, but there was no official separation of the, of the races at all. Their, all the races went to all the schools and restaurants and and uh, bathrooms and, and all of that. So we went from there to the east coast and then up north. In the meantime, uh, I'd lost a day already, longer on the trip than I had planned, which is critical mm. later. So we uh, go to Washington, D.C. We had a grand time there. It was really interesting. Didn't get to go to the museums much, but uh, we, we, we camped right on the Potomac. And uh, there's a little island there with, in those days, camping. This was 1960. And uh, uh, we could take the kids out in the buggy. And uh, then we went to New York. That was really something. Uh, we went to the United Nations a couple times, and we saw there the, the uh, gift that the Netherlands had given to the United Nations building, you know, that uh, uh, swing of, of uh, what was it, Foucault. Foucault, and uh, uh, that was very impressive, I thought, that you see the earth really moves. Mm -hmm. This proves it, that all by itself, that thing starts moving around in a circle every 24 hours. So uh, that was nice, but I lost another day. Mm -hmm. uh, that we took too long. We camped across in New Jersey, in a camping there, and we drove the car plus a trailer in which we had our camping gear and so on, and all the luggage that would have to go on the boat to the Netherlands. I planned all that, and I had. Uh, uh, plan to build a crate at the end of our journey in Quebec to put there all our camping stuff so that that could go to the Netherlands too on the boat. Talking about crazy. but <laughs> It sounds perfectly sensible to me. You were <laughs> going to use the trailer to make the crate out of maybe, right? No, no, no. no I would have to buy that. The, oh, okay. the, the trailer was a very solidly Build sell trail, the, and I was going to sell both car and, and trailer, trailer as a package. As a package, yeah. Uh, okay, so New York was, was a great adventure, but I'd lost two days by then already. So we went farther north, and we just didn't go to Boston. I had planned to spend the day around Boston as an old historic English kind of colony there, but. Uh, 
no. So we went further up and in Massachusetts. Uh, we found a camping, and that's where I, and close by was a little town, and that's where I bought wood for the car and had it sawed to my specifications mm -hmm. and I bought some uh, of the necessary gear, screws and, and so on. And from there we went to Maine. That was going to be our last stop mm -hmm. before going to Canada. And in Maine at a little lake we camped and that's where I started building the crate mm. <laughs> in the, on the camping. And already some people looked at us like, what, what the heck are they doing there? And there was this Dutchman. Obviously, we were foreigners. And, and he's, he's building a crate. Well, I sort of built the crate, except for the cover. I made the cover separate so that I could later Put that on. Did you have carpentry experience? No. Well, so how did you... But that didn't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I was kind of a little handyman as a teenager. I, I, I learned that and uh, the kind of different jobs that I, that I managed to find for myself. Uh, so I wasn't afraid of that. And uh, my wife was very forgiving and mm -hmm. understanding, even if she couldn't make heads or tails out of what I was doing. Uh, so, okay, the crate is ready. Most of the regular gear that we had taken along, I could put in it with the last little pieces still outside of the crate, the uh, camping stove and a few things like that. And we went off to Canada. By this time, I had lost three days. Which meant that I had uh, to go to Canada, to Quebec, and then immediately go back, because I had one day by that time to go back to the United States and sell the car and get on the bus and then make it back to Quebec. So yeah, we weren't sure we could do that. Uh, I said, well, in any case, you, my wife, and you, my mother, and the two kids, you get on board. Uh, we'll find a motel not too far from the harbor, and uh, you get my last money. And uh, if I don't make it back in time, you get on board, you go to the Netherlands. I'll, I'll somehow make it back there. I mean, with the experience I had had as a refugee and so on, I wasn't afraid that I would make it back to the Netherlands in time for my new job. But, uh, uh, well, they were a little antsy about the whole thing. Well, yeah, what can you do? Mm -hmm. uh, so we make it to Quebec the afternoon of the day before the day that the boat leaves. So I would have one day the next day. So we find a motel not far from the harbor. And before getting to the motel, I put the crate together with the cover on the side of the road, almost caused an accident mm. because it was on a curve and outside of the curve was a, a piece of grass and that's where we stopped and my mother and uh, Ine made some coffee and tea and so on on the camping stove while I was putting the last pieces together of the crate. And so when they were done with the stove, we put the, crate, the stove in the crate, and I hammered the uh, whole thing shut. Uh, or rather, I used some screws to make sure it would hold, and then some nails. And that's where I almost caused an accident, because people would be running that curve and would see this crazy scene on the side of the road <laughs> and would almost lose sight of where they were going and crash off the road. But OK, that didn't happen. And uh, uh, OK, so we go to the motel. And uh, uh, I take off back to the United States after a quick uh, rest for a few 
couple of hours. And so in the very early morning, I get back to Maine. The border guard really thought this guy is weird. Because he, he explained, but you're supposed to get on board tomorrow, right? I said, yes. But you, you, you want to sell this car here then? Yes, I said, I have to because I cannot sell it in Canada. I know, he said, I know. What if you can't sell it to, today? This was in the morning of the day that I had to sell the car. I said, well, I just have to sell it. Mm. Necessary, I can always leave it on the side of the road or give it away. Oh, well, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> I said, well, I, I can't go back now because what do I do with this car in Canada? Yeah. Okay, he says, but the, the, your visa says you have to get out of here tomorrow or, or today, mm. later in the day. I said, yes, I know. I will do that. Well, I could speak English at least. So he recognized that this is at least a guy with some education. Uh, but, but he finally literally threw up his hand and said, okay, you go, just make sure you get out of here later in the day. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir, I will. And I went. It was too early in the morning to start selling the car yet. It was like 6.30 or something like that. But I also began to realize that the farther I get into the United States, the earlier I will have to catch the bus to go back. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Uh, so I thought, well, I'll not drive too fast then. And I'll tell you, at the first gas station I needed to go to, to get more gas in the car, I stopped, and by that time it was 7.30, and the gas station had just opened. And the guy who helped me to get gas in the car, they still did that in those days, remember? Right. The good old days, they yeah. would put the gas. I said to him, would you be interested in buying this car? What, he says. <laughs> he knew, of course, by that time I was a foreigner. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, and I quickly told him sort of the story. Uh, I have a boat to catch tomorrow in Canada, and I cannot sell the car there, so I had to go back here to the United States, so I have to try to get sell this car. He looked at me quite like, do I believe this or not? Well, he said, how much do you want for the car? So uh, I said, so and so much, I don't remember, $350 or something. He said, oh, can, I, can I check it out? I said, sure. So he checked out the trailer, which was very solidly built, and he opened up the motor cap and he checks the car and, and he listens to it. He says, well, it looks like the car is in pretty good shape and the price is good, but, but I do want to talk to my lawyer first. I want to show him your papers to see if that looks in order. He said, okay, I'll wait. So he takes off. And I don't know if he had to call the lawyer out of bed or not, because it was barely 8 o'clock by then. Uh, he goes to his lawyer, and he comes back to the car a little later. He says, well, the lawyer says it's OK. So, uh, OK, I'll buy the car. Mm. And I said, well, can I catch that bus to Canada here somewhere? Oh, yeah, he says, right here in town. It was close by a little town. Bingham, Maine. I will always remember that name. Tiny little town, 2,000 people lived there. So. But he wouldn't let me alone. I mean, he became really concerned. I'll never forget that day. It was still very early. The bus wouldn't come until uh, early afternoon, and I could make it well in time to Quebec. But he had to go with me to the little restaurant close to the bus stop. And this was one of those towns where everybody knows everybody and knows the business of everybody. So he has to tell everyone around having breakfast there, what's up with this, with this foreigner here? And uh, uh, they were all very interested. <laughs> so I, I sit there, he just had to go back to his business after a while. Uh, and he does, but 
I'm there the center of attention and I'm quite aware of it. Now I have to go to a post to the station close by and I did that and I mailed some letters uh, that I had been writing while in that cafe. And uh, so before I knew it, it was afternoon and I had a little lunch and I look at my watch and they ca several came by. Yes, sir, you, you, you have to catch the bus. And they didn't let me finish eating. They wanted to make sure I would get on that bus. And by that time, there were a lot more people. In the restaurant. And now my uh, buyer of the car came back. Also, he wanted to he wanted to see me leave. And so finally, about a half hour before the bus was due, they insisted I leave that little restaurant and go and sit on the bench by the stop for the bus. Also, I do that, and there's now a little crowd around me. And they tell everybody who comes by what was going to happen. <laughs> I've never been in the center of attention that much. And I'm not sure I enjoyed it, but it wasn't bad. I mean, they were all so nice and very friendly and very concerned. And they, they kept asking questions, how about your wife and your kids and so on. So there comes the bus. And uh, they almost literally helped me get up from the bench and go Watch, wait there for the door to open, and literally pushed me in, and quickly told the chauffeur he has to go to Quebec. Uh -huh. So I sit there at the window of the bus, and the bus leaves, and I got a farewell. You wouldn't believe they were all waving their hands and uh, shouting farewell or good, good trip and all of that, and uh, so I. I sit in the bus and I'm going to make it. I got the money, so I got money too now. Right. Uh, uh, but I was going to make it at least in time that day mm. to the rest, to the uh, 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 the place where my wife and, and mm -hmm. my mother and my two kids were right. still waiting for me. Right. So we got to Quebec finally. I had fallen asleep because I hadn't slept the night before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had fallen asleep in the bus. It was comfortable. And the bus passes the place where they are waiting by the window for the bus to stop in front of the motel. And I don't get out. <laughs> and they say, oh boy, he hasn't made it. Well, I guess we'll just have to go to get a taxi tomorrow morning and go to the harbor and get on board ship. Now I woke up just after the bus had, was about to leave this, the place where the motel could still be seen. So I wake up and I see the motel go by. Mm. And I said, oh well, I got out of the next stop and I walked back. Uh, which wasn't heavy. I, I had only a very tiny suitcase with a few clothes that I was prepared to use if I had had to stay in the United States. Oh, the relief on my wife's face and my mother's face mm -hmm. when I came into the door of that motel room where we were. Now we were with the five of us. Well, I had a good night's sleep, I'll tell you that. Uh, that day. And the next day, we went to the harbor. Uh, I had already, the, the, the previous day, delivered the crate okay. and our regular luggage. I really were, was like this when I saw that crate go up and it was hauled into the ship. But it made it. It was yeah. fine. I had built a, a fairly Decent crate, Did they have apparently. Some specifications you had to follow in no. building that? No, no, yeah. no. They had bigger crates than mine. Okay. Oh yeah, no. This was a real passenger ship. Yeah. And, and there, uh, there may even have been some cars that they. That, that right. They, it was common that that's how people would pack stuff on yeah. crates, right? Oh yeah. yeah. I was yeah. just thinking about your mother. 
seeing you, and it just reminded me of when you went to Singapore, and there she was, yeah. know, after you had been separated yeah. for yeah. that long time. Yeah. Well, here she was not afraid of being definitely separated, but right. when she was 63, mm -hmm. f almost four by yeah. that time, but she was still in a very good shape, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, her husband had died uh, quite a while before already, uh, yeah. Almost ten years, eight years before. Right. Well, what a great story! Uh, but okay, so we made it on board yeah. ship, and we had a good trip home with the five of us. And there, we first stayed with my parents-in-law for a couple of days, right. and what, then remember the ship. What was the? Was that it was the. Uh, I think it was called the Seven Provincian. Okay. Which was sort of yeah, like the Proto Bear. But it, yes, yeah. and, and, and it was a comparable kind of ship, right. not a huge okay. cruise ship or big passenger ship, but a middle-sized passenger okay. ship that regularly went between North America, South America, and Europe. Okay. So yeah. that was uh, one of the great adventures of our life. We had a very good time, except the last two, three days were a little Storm. exciting. Because of the weather? Yeah, and later they asked me, how could you do that with two little kids? Uh, and I guess my only answer is, well, when you are 31 years old, you think you can do anything. Yeah. You can handle any situation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we did. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> the people in the Netherlands, when we came back, those solid, steady going, Dutchman, yeah. going slow and just whatever. They just could hardly believe mm -hmm. that we had done this. I love the part about the people in Bingham. Oh, yeah. So friendly. Uh, for them, it was... A, Adopted you, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. For them, this was a great, great day. Yeah. Uh, th that was the talk of the town for a while, I'm almost sure. And I had almost had the idea, well, someday I want to go back here. Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, Never it never happened. came to that. No. no. Great. And I don't know what the town is like now anymore. Right. This was a real rural, small American town yeah. with people who didn't speak any languages and had hardly ever seen somebody uh, out of their kind of countryside. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no black people that, that I ever saw there. Uh, it, it was the kind of place you read about in stories about uh, old New England, mm -hmm. you know, one of those. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's stop here. I think uh, I want to come back <laughs> next week. Oh, yeah, to, sure. Yeah. Has it been an hour? It's been actually about 50, 30 minutes. Yeah. I so, thought it was not. Uh, right. I mean, it seems like a good time, and I. Oh, I fine. feel I feel you're tired, and and I want you to think about uh, next next week, because I want you to really we'll spend an hour. I want you to do a lot of reflection, and share your wisdom of. I don't know about 90, wisdom, but 90, I'll, I'll, are you ninety four? I will be ninety three in October. Ninety three in October. I hope if all goes well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, just... Uh, it's been a long life. I know. It's and generally, it's been a good life, at least for me. Lots of fortune. Yeah. A fortunate yeah. son. Yeah. My brother, older brother, died the day before he turned 73. Oh, wow. Uh, That's me. I'm 70. Cancer. I'm 72. You're 72. Yeah. Yeah. My father died at 59. Mine was 51. Yeah. And uh, he did not have a good ending. It was a painful yeah. business with kidney uh, problems and so on. Yeah. And in those days, no dialysis, certainly no transplant. So uh, he just had to go the whole route of all the pain and discomfort and so on. And that's where he finally died of. Yeah. After he had had a big massive stroke two years earlier. Yeah. yeah. 
No, uh, my mother lived till 93. Right. She was 93. And Innie, my wife, had just turned 94 when she died a month and a half ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah, my wife made it to 83. 83. Yeah, also. Well, that so was a very long life in yeah. our earlier days. Now they talk about it being normal for a newborn child to reach 100. At least girls. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, okay, we're going to stop for now. Um. <laughs>